ABC, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Sitting in tonight, Diane Sawyer. Good evening. The question tonight is whether the Soviet Union will be a union much longer. The Baltic republics have now been officially recognized as independent states by a number of countries around the world, though not so far by the U.S. And speaking to the Soviet parliament in Moscow today, Mikhail Gorbachev seemed to accept the possibility that the Baltics aren't the only republics on their way out. We begin in Moscow with our bureau chief, Jim Lorry. Mikhail Gorbachev today struggled to remain relevant. After his three-day detention last week, he said he was a changed man. I have returned from the Crimea to a different country as a person who looks at everything with different eyes. He pledged no more barriers to a market economy and private property. He promised new national elections, including a vote for president, as soon as possible. He called for the signing of his union treaty of power sharing with the republics. With no real alternative, he finally gave in to Baltic demands to be free of Moscow. They should be given the right of independent choice. We must start at once business-like negotiations with those who want to leave the Union. But if Gorbachev was a new man, his transformation may have come too late to keep the Union together. Republic leaders who spoke today made plain the Union Treaty is no longer acceptable. The republics now want nearly all the power. Nusultan Nazarbayev, leader of Kazakhstan, the second largest republic. I was an active champion of the prompt signing of a union treaty. But the recent events showed how volatile the old pattern is. The treaty now needs revision. Nazarbayev told reporters only a voluntary economic confederation was now possible. The republics would have their own parliaments, own armies, and conduct their own foreign affairs. Boris Yeltsin, the man who is now seen to wield the most influence in this fragmented country, stayed out of the political debate today, attending a Russian Orthodox service for the victims of last week's coup. It may be that Yeltsin will have to broker a deal to forge some kind of new, looser relationship between Moscow and the republics. Former Foreign Minister Edward Shevardnadze views this new situation with alarm. I agree the agreement has collapsed. Today's session clarified nothing. I fear there may be a period of chaos ahead. There have been suggestions Shevardnadze might return as Soviet Foreign Minister. When he was asked about that tonight, Shevardnadze replied, Foreign Minister of what? We must see first if there'll be a Soviet Union. Jim Laurie, ABC News, Moscow. It's one thing to declare your independence and have other nations recognize it. It's another to wake up this morning to the reality of the Soviet presence. The government of Lithuania today began issuing its own travel documents and claiming control over its own borders. But achieving real independence takes time. ABC's John Donvan is in Lithuania. When Lithuania sent its own customs officials out to control traffic at its border with Poland early this morning, the Soviets, already doing that job, made room for them. But they did not leave. The same happened at Lithuania's international airport here in Vilnius. The Lithuanians began stamping passports. Their uniformed Soviet counterparts went on checking travelers' documents also. It was a good example of Lithuanian-Soviet cooperation, but whether it was a good example of Lithuanian independence is another question. As Lithuanians kept chipping away today at the base of the statue of Lenin removed last week, no one knew for certain whether Moscow has accepted that its authority here has run out, at least in the eyes of most of the world. That, say Lithuanians, is why U.S. recognition is so important. Lithuanian officials say that if the U.S. is not seen taking Baltic independence seriously, then Moscow might feel it doesn't have to either. Yet with real independence now more likely than ever, the mood in Vilnius these last few days has been curiously flat. No cheering or church bells. On the number 11 bus out to the suburbs, one passenger said that everything has happened too quickly to sink in. It is still too early for questions on how an independent Lithuania is supposed to work. How, for example, a nation linked for half a century to the Soviet economy will survive on its own. Or what should happen to the thousands of Russians living in the Baltics? When one Russian in this group said he wants to stay a Soviet citizen, Lithuanians told him he should accept a Lithuanian passport or leave. There are also fears about security. 
Only yesterday, the Lithuanians arrested three Soviet Air Force majors who were dressed in civilian clothes and driving around with loaded weapons. It is not certain what they were up to, and the incident clearly made Lithuanian police nervous, even if it was a rare instance of Lithuanian authority having the upper hand. John Donvan, ABC News, Vilnius, Lithuania. As Western nations moved quickly today toward establishing diplomatic relations with the Baltics, there was a notable holdout, the United States. President Bush is still taking a wait-and-see approach. Here's ABC's Brit Hume. The president is supposed to be the man who takes the lead in the Western alliance, but after an overnight visit from Canada's Mulroney, he found himself next to a man who had already done today what Mr. Bush was still not prepared to do, formally recognize the Baltic republics. I think we have certain special responsibilities. We've already stated our conviction that not only will they be free, but they'll be independent. Uh, and I'd, I'd just like to see a little bit more, a uh, few more cards on the table. The president was vague about what those cards might be, but he was a bit more explicit about what worries him. I don't want to be a part of making a mistake that might contribute to uh, some kind of anarchy uh, inside the Soviet Union. And I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I don't see that we could do that, uh, but I want to be darn sure we don't. And these developments are happening very, very fast. Though he and Mulroney said they would provide the Soviets food if it's needed this winter, Mr. Bush was again cautious about economic assistance to shore up the Soviet economy. Too many uncertainties, he said, about the shape of the country. Some want to stay affiliated with the center. And to do that, if they're going to get aid from the West, they're going to have to have some agreement, a treaty, some understanding, so people know who they're dealing with. Administration officials say the issue of economic aid could take a while to decide, while recognition of the Baltics could come in a matter of days. The main obstacle, they say, is that some of the borders in the region are in dispute, and the administration wants to be careful not to appear to take sides. Brit Hume, ABC News, Cannabunkport, Maine. In a moment, spreading the blame for the coup. Some fear it's turning into a witch hunt. And here at home, college-bound students are scoring lower on their entrance exams. And rollerblades, the potential for thrills and disaster. This is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Brought to you by Scope. Gorbachev, who stood before the Supreme Soviet today, was a man still in search of firm footing, still chastened by the upheaval of the past week. He said that he himself had to accept some of the blame for the coup. He said he had been indecisive and too tolerant of his enemies. No longer. The search for those enemies has now fanned out across the Soviet Union, and as Rick Interfirth reports, a lot of people are caught in the net. Anatoly Lukyanov was forced to resign today as chairman of the Soviet National Parliament. He was clearly distressed after accusations that he was the chief ideologist behind the coup although there has been no direct evidence. Where were you on the day of the coup and in the days that followed? So many Soviets are being asked that question that some people fear a witch hunt is underway. If we start a witch hunt now, asking who said what, who kept silent, who was against, well, we in the Soviet Union have great experience at this kind of thing. Are we going to start arresting them during the night again? Clearly, the coup involved more than the eight members of the emergency committee, but it also appears old political scores are being settled. Different political groups and different uh, walks of society are trying to take kind of a revenge uh, against the other group. There is particular concern about the purge now taking place in the Soviet military. Eighty percent of the high command will be replaced. Boris Yeltsin went on television last night to urge that the law be respected. No revengeful acts are permissible. Otherwise, we wouldn't be Democrats. That would be just another extreme. The law is the law. Maybe so, but as one reformer here put it, those who suffered from the organizers of the coup have a right to point fingers. Rick and Deferth, ABC News, Moscow. If fingers are being pointed, it is inevitable that many of them will aim at a group of right-wing politicians and military leaders who have leveled vitriolic opposition at Mr. Gorbachev for months now. However, they're on the defensive. Here's ABC's Jim Hickey. They call him the Black Colonel. Viktor Alksnes, leader of Soyuz, the ultra-right-wing faction in the Soviet parliament. 
He and other members of Soyuz are suspected of playing hidden roles in last week's coup. In the Supreme Soviet today, Auxnes angrily denied that, saying, in effect, prove it. But he also was one of the few to speak up for the imprisoned coup conspirators, saying they should have a chance to defend themselves. The black colonel is a real colonel in the Soviet army. He and other members of Soyuz believe the most important problem facing the Soviet Union is its disintegration, and they have been out to prevent it. Auxnes is from Latvia. He admits belonging to a group which, last January, tried to seize power there to prevent its independence. Five people were killed. In rally after rally, Auxnes cries, to the Union, yes, but to its breakup, yeah. Soyuz had the largest voting bloc in the Congress of People's Deputies. But the dramatic events here have changed things. A lot of deputies have changed their mind. They became suddenly more progressive than they were two, three months ago, even including, if you know, some members of this fraction, Soyuz. Colonel Auxnes admits public opinion has turned against Soyuz but only temporarily. When the economy collapses, when thousands of factories close and millions of people are on the street demanding bread, not democracy, then the time will come for extraordinary measures. For Soyuz, that means emergency rule. They call it order. Their critics call it dictatorship and say the black colonel and his comrades still need to be watched. Jim Hickey, ABC News, Moscow. And another Soviet official has reportedly committed suicide. Nikolai Krichina managed the Communist Party's business affairs. The KGB says he jumped out of the window of his seventh floor apartment. No indication that Krichina was involved at all in the coup. One note on the health of Mrs. Gorbachev. There have been reports that she suffered some kind of serious illness brought on by the coup attempt. Mr. Gorbachev today played down those reports saying everything is okay, there is no danger. We'll have more news in a moment.